know that Jesus was popular in his day. He was very popular, but not as popular as you would think he would be. You, we read about how there were 5,000 people, you know, that came to hear him, him preach his great sermon, Sermon on the Mount. 5,000 people. You would think that is everybody. It wasn't. It wasn't. It was just a small portion of the people. There were many, many, many more people still at home while Jesus is delivering the, the greatest sermon ever preached of all time, of all history. People still marvel at that Sermon on the Mount. And people by the bu bucket loads. I was going to say bus load, but they didn't have buses then. I think they had buckets. <laughs> by the boat load. <laughs> they, they, they missed it. And they could care less. Oh, okay, he's up there. And you know, here, what would you do? What would you do if you were there in that city? I tell you what I would do. I would be right there. I'd be, I would not want to miss a moment of Jesus. I would be there. I'd say goodbye to everything. Okay, Jew, where are you? This is a short moment we have in history. I'm going to be there for you. Did you know that a lot of people, they come so close to Jesus and then, whoop, Jesus who? No, I didn't know. I don't have time for that. And they just completely miss it. Sometimes even us, even myself, I'll be in a moment and I'll just be so focused on what I'm doing. And here's Jesus offering so much, giving so much. And I'm like, eh, I'm so busy. I hope this works. Boy, I'm worried. What's going to happen if it doesn't work? And here's Jesus. All I have to do is turn my attention over and say, Jesus, well, you're here. This shouldn't really be that big of a problem. Oh, good, I'm just going to give it to you. I'm going to put it in your hands and let you go with it. And you know, that is, that is the pattern that God has given us for the Christian life. To look around, to get our eyes off of ourselves, off what we're doing, and see Jesus standing there. We're with him. To not be like the great masses, but to look and to be some of those that say, well, if you're here... I'm going to use you. If you're here, I'm going to go along with you. If you're here, well, let's get you busy too. Let's let you do the things that you do. Let's go, Jesus. And, 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 and let's go. Let's, let's hit it off. Let's, let's make it happen. I don't understand why so many people, even people who know Jesus, will let Jesus do his own thing, and they're over here doing their own thing. No, no. What about people like us saying, what's Jesus doing? Let me get over here. Let me tell you what a lot of it is. It's just an issue a lot of times of trust. Do we trust Jesus enough or not? <laughs> Do we trust him with our problems? Do we trust him with our lives? Do we trust him with our future or not? Or who do we trust? Do we trust ourselves? You know, I had a funny incident yesterday. A couple of days ago, um, Ami told me, she says, oh, you know, I found a really great baker in uh, San Francisco. And boy, he's got the most delicious looking cake, a, a salt caramel cake with buttercream layers and vanilla. So, oh man, that would be a great cake. I said, okay. Her birthday was coming up, right? It was yesterday. So I said, ah, good. <laughs> I don't have to worry about that. I might know just what to do. So I called the baker there in San Francisco and ordered this cake. I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm out of town. I don't have time to bake that cake. Oh, great. Now what am I going to do, right? Let me tell you what I did. <laughs> I called my best friend in the world, Mr. Google. And I typed in that thing, and I found some lady out in the world, you know, out who knows what planet she lives on. I don't care. She had put up a recipe for this cake. And I, you know, I clicked on it, and I saw the recipe and, and read through it. And I said, yeah, I can do this, no problem. And, uh, you know, she had little things, you know, like you're supposed to, uh, you know, split the vanilla bean and scrape it. Now, what the heck is that? Well, then I called my really best friend, my second be other best friend, Mr. YouTube. And did you know that my lads, they're more than happy to show you how to split and scrape a vanilla bean and all these different things. Like, wow, how hard can this be? And I read through, and, and so I went through and I read that recipe again. And at the bottom of that recipe, there were all these sections for comments. And there were 14 comments that people had left on this. And a lot of the comments were hilarious. Are you sure that it's a tablespoon of the fleur de sel? Are you sure that that, because I went to some other, and I saw they're just recommending a teaspoon of this salt. So I'm not sure that this is really a tablespoon. You know, another lady, are you sure that we're supposed to use the nine by 13 quarter, you know, baking pan? Are you sure? Because I don't think it's going to fit, you know, with these, with these cake circles. I'm not rings. I'm not sure. And there's all these different people doubting. And the poor lady, yes, yes, that's what you use. Yes, yes, that's how you do it. Nobody believed her. 
I went into it, and this is what I had to do. I didn't have a clue what to do. So I just took her at her word. I said, okay, if this is what you say you have to do to come out with this cake, then that's what I'll do. I followed the directions. I trusted the lady who said, this is how you make the cake. And then whatever I didn't understand, I went over here, found somebody else to help me out with it. And next thing you know, Ami opens the fridge, gets a big smile. Half the job is done. She likes the way it looks. <sighs> I live another half a day, <laughs> right? <laughs> Women don't have a clue, but all you men know exactly what I'm saying. And then, you know, we cut the cake, and then that's like the moment. That's like, you know, you've been um, sentenced to death, and the executioner is sitting there with his big old, you know, hatchet, and the judge is sitting there, and that's the moment. It depends on what that judge says, you know, am I going to live or am I going to die? There it is, you know. Yes, it's good. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I live another day. I live another day. <laughs> and I've made it through. Largely, why? Because he just followed the directions. Because I trusted the person who came up with the recipe. It's not hard if you just do that. Have you ever worked with somebody and they really didn't know what they were doing and you told them what to do? It wasn't hard. It wasn't complicated. It was simple. You told them what to do and they couldn't do it. Or because they didn't really think you knew the very best way. And so they went over here, tried this, or they came up with an excuse why that doesn't work. Don't you just want to slap those people? <laughs> Don't you just run? You, oh, my Lance, you know what? You have one job to do, you know? Why, why, why don't you just do what, you know? I'm paying you to do, and you still can't do it, right? Oh, boy. You know, that's a very common thing. Sometimes that's all we want. Sometimes even with our relationship with God, it is that simple. It's all God's saying. Now, I know a lot of us really stress out over our wise birthdays, but there's something else we stress out over constantly, and that's money, money, money. And I'm going to tell you that the Bible presents a direction for you so you will not be stressing out over money. So that it will not shorten your lifespan by making your heart age at you know, a rapid pace. So it doesn't screw up the jobs you take and the things you do and all that. There's a solution to all that. And there's a lot of rejection by people to the solution. Only because those are the people who see Jesus doing his thing over there. And they say, no, no, I'm going to do my thing over here. So I'm calling to the people who see Jesus doing his thing over here and said, oh, I'm going to come over here. Forget that over there. I'm going to let Jesus do his thing. So if you're somebody who would say, I'm going to let Jesus do his thing, then you're going to let, you're just going to be a good solution for it. Otherwise, you know, go, I don't know, go back to, to Kramer or whoever helps you out with your finances, Oprah or whoever it is, Susie Orman, I don't know, <laughs> whoever, whoever the, the big shot is. But, but, but if you're looking to Jesus, see what Jesus is doing, what Jesus is saying, then, then come over here. Because Jesus makes it very clear that, that tithing, that giving to God, being generous to God, first and foremost, the first place, that's the solution to financial stress. That's the solution. Tithing is never a question about money. It is not about money. If you tell somebody about tithing and they're not close to Jesus, what they say is, oh, no, that's about money. That's about, and you're like, you're close to Jesus. So you're looking at this, no, it's really not about money. It's about trust. <laughs> Who do you trust? It's about trust. The tithe is always a question about trust. It is not about money. It's about trust. And it's something when we trust the Lord, we trust Jesus in our lives, it blesses literally every aspect of our lives. We don't trust Jesus with our marriage. We don't trust Jesus with our uh, career. We don't trust Jesus with our own dark hearts. We don't trust Jesus with our future and our home in eternity, and then not trust Jesus with our money. It's all kind of the same. You don't get to say, yes, for all this, but no for this one over here. No, no, no. If it's no for this one over here, there's a whole lot more coming over here than you might have imagined. So I'm going to share with you guys a little bit about this. One of my favorite stories is found in 2 Kings chapter 4. And it's a, a beautiful story about Elisha. And Elisha had this guy who worked for him as part of his group. But this guy died. Imagine that, a guy dying, huh? Isn't that the way it is? And so he left his widow. His widow is freaking out. He didn't take care of me. He didn't provide for me. Now I'm in trouble, so I'm going to go find my husband's boss. And I'm going to go talk to him. 
and see if he can help me out because I'm in big, big trouble. So here we are in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. And I want you to notice what Elisha says to the woman and what the woman does and what happens. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Obviously, this woman had small children. If they were teenagers, she would have welcomed the creditors coming to take her two boys. But as children, Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? There's the question. What do you have? And look at her answer. It's always the same. Your servant has nothing there at all. I've got nothing. And isn't that the way it is when we come to the Lord? Well, you tell me, what do you got? I wouldn't be coming to you if I had anything. I'm coming to you because I have nothing. So help me out with this one. But she steps back and she says, well, I guess I do have one thing, right? Except a small jar of olive oil. So I just want you to know that this jar isn't going to go anywhere. Your servant has nothing at all except a small jar of olive oil. Sometimes the servant sees nothing. <laughs> Sometimes we are oblivious because we are so fixated on what we don't have, we forget the little bit we do have. But isn't that what the Lord uses every single time? He uses the little that we have. He uses the little that we have. I remember Mike reminded me of that story where Jesus fed the 5,000. And what did he use? He used the little the, the, the fish and the bread of that little boy, and then Jesus did the rest. So it matters what you have. What do you have? And Elisha said, go around, ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside, shut the door behind you and your sons, pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. What? Are you serious? I just told you I have a jar, a small jar of oil. And you're asking me to go get a bunch of empty jars. And what do you think is going to happen there, Elijah, when I pour my oil into the next jar? You're, what do you think is going to happen? I'm going to be out of oil in my jar. Now I have one jar that's got oil in it. Isn't that the way it is? The Lord comes to us and tells us, do this. And then our response is, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> that's the dumbest thing. But this is what she does. When you're desperate, you do what you got to do. Isn't that right? When you're desperate, you do what you got to do. And this is what she did. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all the jars are full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there's not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on what is left. When all the jars were filled, let me tell you what, this is the story you hear time and time and time again. I don't know how we had enough oil to fill another jar. I don't have a clue how the money lasted to get to this point. That is the story Christians have been telling for millenniums. <laughs> when Jesus tells us to trust him with the, what is his, with the first fruits, with the tithe, the story is not, and then I didn't have that either. <laughs> that is not the story. None of us, none of us would be tithing today if that were the story. None of us, not even me, is that dumb. <laughs> we would not. No, the story is not, and then I did what God told me to do, and then I didn't have that either. Well, wasn't that a brain thing to do? No, that's not. Well, why do you think so many people tithe? Why do you think people that you, you, you admire tithe? Why do you think people you, that are so successful, why do you think people who really have their heads right and their marriage is strong and, and really live vibrant lives for the Lord and passionate lives and the, those people that we are a tribe, why do you think so many of those people tithe the way they do? Because they've learned that lesson. You do what the Lord tells you to do and it always goes, it always goes, it always goes. There's all 
always more. It's not about what you gave. It's about what God did. It's not about what you had. It's what, about what God gave you. That's what it is. It's not about you sitting in your house and watching TV while the Lord's over here giving his greatest sermon. No, it's about you getting up and going over here and hearing that greatest sermon and receiving what the Lord has. So many of us get going in our lives and all we have is what we have. We don't have what the Lord has. We don't have what the Lord gives us because where we are holding on to our little jar. I got my one jar. <laughs> it's my way that have a lot of oil in it but boy what it has it's mine and the Lord's saying hey give that to me give me a portion of that oh I'm not giving this to anybody I'm holding on to this and you know what you have at the end of your story one little jar filled with oil that's what I got here last me no not enough but I got it right here that's what you have meanwhile the person who trusts the Lord the person who depends upon the Lord the person whose life is absolutely in expectation of what God can do they're going oh my where'd all this oil come from this is crazy. I've got enough oil for every door hinge in my house now. I could, I, I could give an oil change to a semi. This, where did I get all this oil from? It's amazing. That's the story. Why do you think the story of tithing has made it this long and into this culture? Why? Is it because those who poo-poo it are right? No, it's because those who poo-poo it don't have a clue what they're talking about. Those are the people with the one little jar. I got my one little jar. Those are the people. It's the people with a lot of jars. They're telling a secret to their friends and their Christians. They're saying, let me tell you what, if you depend on the Lord, if you do things the way the Lord tells you to, you'll be amazed at his blessing in your life. I'm just telling you right now. I don't want a lot of people to know because I don't want there to be less blessing for me. So, but I'm going to tell you because you're a special friend. Go with what the Lord is saying. Go with what the Lord is saying. And that's how the Lord brings us about so i'm going to share with you very quick i'm going to share you what exactly is a tithe what exactly is a tithe for that i'm going to tell, share with you uh two verses psalm 24 and this is an overarching what it is i'm going to tell you why we tithe and and then that'll be the end but right now right off the top what is the tithe what is it number one everything belongs to the Lord. It's an understanding that I don't own anything. It's an understanding that I recognize that I came into this world without anything, and I will be leaving this world without anything, and I am here using resources that were here long before I ever arrived, and will be here long after I depart from this world. So I am here for just a short period of time. The one who owns everything on both sides of my lifespan and right during my lifespan is the Lord Almighty. That's the one who owns everything. And I will steward his gifts to me, his blessings, what he allows me to have during this time the way he wants it done. That's what it is. Psalm 24, verse 1. The Lord, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. That's where it begins. It's understanding. It's not mine to be saying this. And we'll come touch on this a little bit later. But it starts with that idea. It all belongs to the Lord. Here's a second one. Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. It is recognizing that in God's economy, the way he wants his children to follow is you set aside 10% of that which the Lord gives you of, of, of increase, that of produce. Whatever you produce, whatever you increase, whatever you trade your hours for at life, whatever they give you in return, whether it be Bitcoin or a paycheck, whatever you get, you get 10% back to the Lord. That belongs to the Lord. Why? Because it is holy. It is holy. Now, what does that word holy mean? We've brought this up several times. Holy means it is separate from the use of the world. It is separate for the purpose of God. You could have two, you know, two wash basins. One wash basin you take home and use any way you want. But there was a special wash basin that was only special because it had the label holy attached to it. That was the wash basin that was taken to the temple, to the house, the residence, the very geographical location of God. This is only used for the rituals. This is only used for the purpose of God, this over here. That was what made it holy. So when you get any increase, when you get any uh, result or return, turn on your effort or your work, whatever it is, there's a portion of that, whether you recognize it or not, that is holy by the Lord. He is already in advance designated, this belongs to me, this is mine. So isn't that so? When you look at that, you're saying, wow, a portion of that is already holy because God is working through you. That is God's initiative. That's what he has already done. And let me, let me tell you, sometimes it's kind of funny, people get confused because a tithe, you know, comes out of the word 10, and so it's 10%. And I know that this is very difficult math. And fortunately, you've got me, a math genius, to explain this to you. 
So you have uh, $10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, good. I was scared it doesn't get to nine or something like that. <laughs> right? You got ten of these things. This is what 10% is. One. <laughs> one out of the ten. So now here is one. Here's nine. Here's the other. This is what this is. This is for me to use, and I'd recommend you take one of those and put it in savings. And over here, this is God's. Mine, God's. Very simple. <laughs> Very simple. But let me, let me uh, throw a, a little curveball to you. wonder if instead of $1 bills, we go up to $100 bills. Oh, man. That's a lot of money. <laughs> $100 bills. And there's 10 of them. Okay, I get that. 10%. Okay, here's... Here's, here's one, here's nine of them. So I'm thinking, for some reason, the math was a lot easier to understand when it was $1 bills. <laughs> it's very strange. But Einstein explained to us, no, hold, hold steady, hold still. Don't freak out. <laughs> I know it's a whole lot more zeros. <laughs> It's still one out of the ten. You, this one is holy. This one belongs to God. Over here, over here, I recommend you take one out, put it in savings. The rest, you spend any way you want, even if it is on all your wife's birthday cake. You just spend it. That's, that comes out of here. This one is holy. Now, I'm going to put this right over here and, um, and ask that you not steal that because you'll get into trouble because I printed that off the copier. <laughs> and so if you steal that, somehow or another it's going to come back to me, I know, and I'm going to get in trouble. So please do not give this to anybody. <laughs> Especially to the Lord. <laughs> Wouldn't that be funny if we got caught in our church but then take money? <laughs> you know what? Oh. Geez, look here, I've got six minutes. Okay, I'm going to tell you the funniest story. When I was in Los Angeles, I pastored a very old church too. And this church had the funniest story that I was the only one that laughed at. So you know it's really funny when I'm the only one that laughs. Because you can just tell how funny it was. This church, in the early days, was a very big church, very growing church. And they had a printing press. And they print all their stuff. It's a really great printing press. The kids in the youth group had a great idea why don't we print money? And they did. And within about three months, the law had caught up to them, and all of them were in juvenile delinquent, you know, delinquents. And that story never went away. That was still there. They would whisper, do you remember when Jerry got caught and the police arrested him for counterfeit? <laughs> was not that funny? Yeah, see why the... You might want to sell your teenagers into slavery? So anyways, that was a funny thing right there. Yeah, don't counterfeit money. It's a terrible thing. <laughs> Especially that one, the, the, the 10% there one. Uh, <laughs> Matthew 6, 21. Why? Why do we tithe? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Because God knows that's just the way it is. God's greatest temptation for our hearts, God's greatest temptation, God's greatest competition for our hearts is money. That's God's greatest competition. That's it. That's the big one. That's a, how are we going to make this happen? When you keep moving over there to your money, having your confidence and depending upon it, how are, we, how are we going to make this work? How are you going to do it? And God has to do battle with that. He's got to do battle with that biggest one. So God calls us right off the bat, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The words of Jesus, very insightful. Yeah, that's where it is. How about instead, how about if we move your treasure over into me? How about if I become your treasure? Because where your treasure is, your heart will soon follow. So make me your treasure. Depend on me. Look to me. Expect from me. And then your heart will be right there with me. That's a very important lesson. That's a reason. That's why we tie. Because it's about God. It's not about this world. It's not about what we can do. It's not about what others can do. It's about what God can do. Our destiny is in God's hands. And then the, the second verse I want to share with you is in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Honor the Lord with your wealth, 
when you get a paycheck, what does that represent? That represents the hours you gave somebody. A good person, a bad person, it doesn't matter. It's what you gave to somebody. And what did they give you in exchange? They gave you some form of money. And that represents your life. That represents what you did. God is calling us to honor him with our wealth. Honor him as a representation of our days. Honor him with a representation of our work. Honor him, honor him, honor. When we give to the Lord, what are we doing? We are honoring God. We are, isn't that something? We're honoring God. How beautiful is that? How powerful is that? We're honoring God. You know, the, uh, the, the Lord brought attention to the, the people of Malachi, and the prophet of Malachi and the people in the Old Testament at the very end of it. A lot of people think of it as an Italian uh, town called Malachi, but it is not. It's Malachi somewhere else. And the, God came there and he said to those people, he said, you guys uh, come back to me. You're far from me. And the people, well, what do you mean? You're right here. We're right here. How, how can we be far from you? Yeah, yeah, you, you left me when you cheated me, when you robbed me. That's when you, oh, oh come on, God. How do you mean cheated you? How, how can I do that? How can I rob you? Oh, yeah, you have you robbed me. You cheated me with your tithes, with your tithes and your offerings. And this is Malachi chapter 3, verse 7 and 10. You have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you. There's your good news. There's your answer. There's a solution to the stress. I will return to you. When you get your life right with God, it's crazy how finances all of a sudden start falling into place. Things start to become right again. When you get your life right with God, it's amazing how your relationships, everything else starts lining up right. When you start getting the one who is number one first in place, we give him a priority and get him moved. Return to me and I will return to you. But you ask, how are we to return? Will, and this is what God's saying to them, will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how are we robbing you? And this is what God says, in tithes and offerings. Now, let me get a load of this. Do you ever feel like you are cursed financially? You ever feel like that? You ever feel, oh, I've got a curse on me when it comes to money. I've got a curse. Let me ask you something. It might be over this issue of what is holy, what belongs to God. It might be you using that, pretending that's yours to use as you desire. It might be such a thing. Because this is what he says. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord. Oh, I'm sorry, let me go back a verse. You, uh, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse. Your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Your whole nation, because you are under a curse. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven to pour out so much blessing that there will be not be room enough to store it. This is what the Lord's saying. Test me. Test me. Test me in this. Let me see. Try it out. You don't have to do it if it doesn't work for you. Do it for a period of a couple of months. Do it. Let me see how God begins working in your life. Test me in this. Let me tell you what. I've tithed this day one of my life. Ami's tithed, same thing. That's not an issue with us. Are we filthy rich? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But let me tell you something. Am I filled with the riches of God? Am I filled with the blessing of God in my life? Let me tell you what, I, I, I laugh my head off. I, I don't know how I could be. It's amazing. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And are the blessings that come my way, are they a result of my hard work and my effort and always being in? No, no. In defiance, in defiance, regardless of the things I've done, regardless of the positions I found myself in, regardless of the mistakes I've made, I've enjoyed God's blessing in my life. I've enjoyed my God's blessing. And let me tell you, I don't know what, what you know, throw open the floodgates of heaven means to, to you or what that is a picture of in your life. But let me tell you, in my life, I have trusted God. And I would say without a doubt in my mind, without any, any doubt, I would laugh at anybody even doubt it. I would say, oh, you have no idea how he has thrown open those floodgates of heaven in my life. You have no idea. You have no idea how, how the blessings, how the, the, the world I live in is built on the foundation of God's blessing in my life. You have no idea. <laughs> Let me tell you what, I am happy, happy, happy to, to, and I encourage you, encourage you. I know money stresses all of us out. 
Put God in first place. Give God what is God's. Let it be. Let it be. Some people say, oh, but pastor, I'm in so much debt. Oh, but pastor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you come to me, and this is just an example, and you are very, 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 very sick, right? You come to me, oh, pastor, I am so sick. And I say, oh, well, let me pray for you. And you say, oh, no, pastor, no. I, I can't have you pray for me because I'm really, really sick. Well, wouldn't that be the time you really need the prayer when you're really, really sick? Wouldn't that be the time that you would really need that prayer? Sometimes people are in such financial straits, they say, no, I, I can't start obeying the Lord now. No, I, I'm just too far gone. <laughs> Don't pray for me, Pastor. <laughs> it says I'm a lost cause. I'm too sick. No, no, that's when. That's when. And let me tell you, when get God at your very worst moment. Get God when you have nothing. That way he gets all the glory and all the praise when he answers your need. When he answers your need, let him have it. Start him at the worst moment of your life financially. Start him at the bottom. Let him prove himself when you've got nothing. Let him see you trusting him because you can't trust yourself. I jar broke. I don't even have a jar. Let God take that moment and build your life from there. That way when you're sitting there with jars all over your table, you can look back and you can tell people, I had nothing. And this is what God God has done when I trusted him and I put my confidence in him. This is how God has blessed me. Start with nothing. Let God prove himself to you there. And when that moment comes and you've got to transfer from this life into the next, you stand before that, that moment and you say, God, I've got nothing. All I've got is the blood of Jesus to take me from this world into the next, into your presence. I've got nothing. I've built nothing. I've accomplished nothing. But I've come to you because I need you. I depend upon you. And you know what the Lord does? He comes and he swoops us up into his arms. And just the way he's carried us through life, he'll carry you into eternity in the same way. God loves a soul that says, I've got nothing, and I depend entirely upon you. And unless you do it, it's not going to happen. Oh, God loves to hear that. God loves to hear that. When you depend upon God at that point, guess what God does? He does it. He does it. He does it. Let God do that in your life. 